What's going on, family? It's your brother Lawrence here with another episode of A2D. I'm here with my sister Delaney. What up, sis? Hey, you guys. It's been a week. I miss you. Y'all, you know, we come together every week to talk about all the things that y'all, we all are talking about, but not necessarily talking about well online and offline, but by design, because our heart is to build community through these conversations. Uh, we intentionally challenge and attack and focus on those difficult conversations, those difficult discussions. And that since our heart is for building community, we touch on everything from romantic relationship, family to friendship. But right now we're talking about relationship and been in the series relationship 101 and we're going to hop right to it, sis. Uh, these are these enduring questions, but we got one today that we're dealing with, sis. What are we talking about? And this week, you guys, the question is how to save a relationship. And that's the question. That's the whole question. How to save a relationship. And I want to, my initial thing is that this is possible. The number one thing you have to decide is that you want to save it. You have to decide that you want to save it. And the person has to decide that they want to save the relationship. If two people, you have to be like, to save a relationship, nobody can be selfish. It is a selfless act. A lot of people be trying to save their pride, to, you know, be defensive and save their ego, their emotions, their this, their that. Saving a relationship is an outer body experience. It is not about you. It becomes about this bond. So if you, to order in order to save a relationship, the number one thing you have to do is make sure that you and your partner have decided it wants to be saved. All right. Hmm. That's my number one. Yeah, I, I think the decision is, is keen um, and really, really keen. I do want to say this. I think it's partly just the setup of these conversations. It's who could come with confidence around this subject. You know, um, there, are, there, are, there are relationships who uh, that should be perhaps, maybe, could be, should be, should be. This is obviously something you should put in quotes, right? Should be saved, could be saved. Um, maybe relationships that maybe you tried to and failed, I think. Um, most people uh, would recognize just if, again, we could bottle that up, look at the divorce rate, right? Um, I'm pretty sure when they went into the into the marriage, their goal was not for it to end, right? Um, when people go into a relationship, the goal is not for it to end, you would hope, you would think. And so I think this is, just to put this in context, I don't think this is something that many people know how to do. We don't, right? Um, and, and this is going on the assumption that people wanted it to last. And so because of that, I, I, I kind of approach this and any of these topics with the, that level of, you know, I have, here's a perspective. I'm just, this is one perspective. A lot of it's from things you've learned, but a lot for many people, this is still a bit aspirational. Even if you're on the side of having one that's uh, uh, a relationship that's sustained for some time, it's still something. So I'm just going to set that up just so people know that, okay, what is this person talking about? How, how could they talk about this? But I think there's a lot to learn. And I do think there, there has to be a commitment to saving it. And I also recognize and, and I think have been around long enough and, and have seen and listened to older, uh, longer term couples long enough is that it's not always both, peop both people who want that at the same time. You could find yourself in a situation where there's not necessarily people. Now, you would not, I think for a long period of time, that would not necessarily be healthy, right? But I think they recognize enough their seasons of life. And so I think you, all you could do is control what you do. And you have to ask the question, are you committed? Because you wouldn't even be there, right? If you, considering the end it, if both people aren't committed, right? But I do think, I agree. I do think for you to what you can't control is, do I want to? Because at the end of the day, the actual saving may actually be driven or may, you may, in some sense, it's both. One person has to accept, or if it's kind of both people missing uh, that play into it. But especially if it's on you, where the, the relationship is crumbling because of your actions primarily, then y you have to be clear you want to save it. And you have to be clear that it, it's probably going to take a lot of your movement in order to kind of, you know, kind of present or at least re-establish, uh, uh, I think, a foundation for it to, it to work. Um, so that's just, I just want to kind of start there to say, I believe that uh, you know, not a, we're not good at this. This is clear. Um, but I just think that what you can control start with you. And I think it's the agreed belief that do you want to, once you're clear with the belief, everything else we'll talk about will follow. Um, I agree with like, it starts off with, do you, so I will go to one of my other points is you have to know yourself. 
You have to know yourself to save your relationship. Because even, you know, I, I, I have another quote that's communication, but that's communication and vulnerability. You have to know yourself to express the needs you need. You can't be like, well, you didn't da 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 da. Did you express yourself and do you know your triggers? Do you know where those triggers stem from? Are you addressing them? Because a lot of time we want to blame our discomfort and our negative feelings on someone else. But here's the thing. Did you walk into a relationship with unrealistic expectations? Did you walk into a relationship thinking that person's supposed to make you happy? And this is like an entertainer, right? This is a teddy bear. This is a toy. This is a game. Did you walk into the relationship knowing that you were going to love a human being with flaws and all, right? What was, do you know yourself? And a lot of people romanticize relationships. They, the, you who are, who are probably complaining about the problem, might have romanticized the situation. So knowing yourself is so important. I think, you know, I think you shouldn't even enter a relationship before you know yourself because you don't even know what you like, what you don't like, and things like that. But you're here now. And you can still get to know yourself while you're here. Or you can at least acknowledge there's some stuff I'm still working out. And I'm sorry. But instead, we spend a lot of time, because there's someone in our relationship, because there's someone there, blaming and projecting. Blaming and projecting is what, like, you need to stop that immediately. And the way you stop it is to know yourself when you are doing it. So I really want to hone knowing yourself, your strength and your weakness and your bad habits. Because those are manifesting. And if you're not even cognizant and connecting things, you might not even know what's happening. You just know you're not happy. Mm. That is that is uh, that is important. I mean, that is important. I, I hmm. I think this is uh, the terrain of to 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 save and sustain a relationship. I think you're in you're in you're in the humility business now. It's kind of like you got to go low. You got to go low, and. One, I think it's, and the reason why I say this is that you have to reestablish something that's broken. Clearly, there's something broken in your relationship, trust, uh, assurance, or this. And again, this is save. We're talking about saving a relationship that should be saved. So all the other auxiliary, if you're kind of thinking from a lens of kind of the worst case scenario or trauma, you may be like, what if it's not? Well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about ones that probably can be and should be saved or potentially could be saved. Humility. And humility and humility specifically means that you again, you have to be in, in a place of vulnerability to be willing to apologize unqualified apology and then unqualified forgiveness. You need an unqualified apology, meaning it's not like, uh, you know, there's a difference between explanation and justification. Explanation is not justification. Just because you can explain why you were doing these things is not a justification for it, which is why apologies are needed. Right. So a lot of times people get in a situation and be like, well, the reason why I did this, well, the reason why I did this, that don't make a difference that it hurt this person and it destroyed your relationship. So just because you can explain it, it does not justify you doing it, which is why there's still a space for healing. Apologies with humility give an opportunity for the water to rush in for there to be healing because this person recognizing, okay, it's almost like somebody's like, there's like a, a mask robber or somebody just cutting people outside. Right. The, you're, you're saying you acknowledge the wrong that is hurting or has hurt me. That's like the, 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 the some sort of uh, people apprehending the person with the knife and taking that person away. The trauma, the, the feeling doesn't go away what that person has done, but at least the threat of it coming back is gone. At least it's gone without apologizing and owning it. That's like the, 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 the person stabbing is still around. So a person can never feel safe to re-engage and, and actually he, uh, close and reconcile and say, I want to do this because you still don't recognize your person with the knife. So that's why humility says, I'm the person with the knife. I did this. I need to let go of the knife. I'm sorry about the impact that th me cutting you did. No qualifications, no explanation that you were hungry and you just need to kill someone. Nothing. 
at, from that place and giving that space for that person could hear that, then it's their choice and it's then their responsibility if they would like to say, because it's a two-sided thing. Once that person has moved in that area, then that person has to then give unqualified forgiveness. Because a lot of times, things are not saved because that person really didn't forgive and they're bringing it up every time. There's, 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 there's a space of, I have to give this person time to heal, right? But there's something about forgiveness. And if you need time to forgive, be honest about that. But if you're gonna give yourself a chance where this person's not discouraged completely, there has to be unqualified forgiveness. And so I think this is a game of humility. Y'all are on your knees. You are kind of just like asking and asking them to kind of bring back. And this is for people with so much pride and be like, well, I did this. You Come on now, come on. Th this is not your terrain. You will not save your relationship, nor will you sustain a relationship if, if pride is your friend. Humility. You got to be hu humble, humble, humble. I really love that. This is the humble game. Um, so I, I'm just gonna, I had forgiveness on here. You have to definitely forgive and not only the other person, but yourself. And you, when you able to forgive yourself, maybe you can enter the humble game a little bit better, but I really want to talk about communication and vulnerability. I really think it's important. Yeah. Don't just be, I, I knew someone who I asked about, like, you know, I had a lot of questions about his twin brother. And I was like, don't you talk to your twin brother? He's like, yeah, but the conversations we have is like a Seinfeld episode where it's much about nothing. You are in a whole relationship. You need to be having vulnerable conversation, communicating in a very vulnerable way. Let me tell you why this is important. And it makes it easier to be humble and forgiving when you can be vulnerable and transparent when there are two vulnerable, transparent people, because then I can understand what makes you triggers because you have articulated your triggers to me. You have articulated your emotional strength and weakness. And when you are vulnerable and transparent, it is easier for people to be empathetic and compassionate with you, which are really requirements and forgiveness, right? So maybe I can understand why this situation might have triggered you because I'm aware of your triggers. You were transparent in communicating them with me, right? So I can have empathy and compassion. Sometimes I can probably be aware of them even when you, like I can be aware that you got triggered just by the situation because we know each other so well because we are communicating vulnerable things about one another and we are being 100% transparent with one another. So therefore we're having conversations that are substantive because I understand every day ain't gonna be a good day for my partner and I'm going to have to forgive him. I'm going to have to be compassionate. I'm gonna have to, there are times he's not gonna even know to articulate or apologize and I have to be forgiving and humble while I wait for him to get it together. While, and the same thing for you know, men and women, I say partner because I'm very, both humans are complicated creatures, okay? Humans are complicated creatures. We are adults now that have a slew of family trauma, friendship trauma, past relationship trauma, and we are constantly in need of forgiveness, grace, and mercy, both of us in this relationship. But it's very good to just be transparent about the scars, about the sensitive spots. Because then I, as your partner, can better understand you, protect you, and try to make sure that I'm not stepping or triggering things while you heal, right? Because you're still a healing person in the relationship. You're still going to get trauma and hurt in the relationship. And I heard a great T.D. Jake sermon called He Motions, and he talks about the turn. Because, you know, most of the times in a relationship, we're going on a steady path. And we're fine, but it's in the turns, in this relationship, in this marriage, in this situation. We get old, we get sick, parents get sick, parents die, babies are born, baby gets sick. All of these things are life turns. And in that turn, you can get, have a whole, we don't even notice you fell off the motorcycle. That's what T.D. Jakes, you know, you're holding on, you're holding on, you think you're, you and your partner are eye to eye and a life event happened and you didn't even know that all of this stuff was happening and you're like, oh, what happened? Where you been at? He probably still mourning his, the loss of his mom nine months ago. You're probably still having postpartum, the baby's one, right? But we have to be 
communicating with vulnerability and transparency what is going on earlier than later. Don't blow up. Say it when it's happening. Trust that there's space for it to be accepted and received. Mm. I, I think that's real. I mean, I, and I think a lot of these, a lot of these things that we're talking about, I think in many ways they're preemptive, right? Pre but you know, they're preemptive, but are also kind of like they're, they're the only healing channels you have. Meaning, if if in order to sustain a relationship, you need to have great communication, right? But if you're going to save it, you certainly need to have great communication, right? I, but I think there's a piece of this too around. Um, we've gotten away from this, I think, as a community, right? And I think we have this triage mentality, which is when things hit the fan, that's when we're going to go, we got to go get couples counseling. We got to go do this. But it's the idea of help, especially if it's kind of like, you know, like, do it if I am. like you're, you're right to the end of that joint, you know, where it's like, there used to be a time, I remember growing up, I remember seeing this when my parents had a, like a real blowout. And I remember this day where it was the aunts and uncles came over to the house. They came over to our house. I don't think you remember this, but like the women were upstairs, the men were downstairs and they were talking to them. And then they brought them in a room, right? I don't remember, I was a kid, right? But I remember this, my sister probably remember this, but like the, the village was part of the accountability in the sense that your village at some point there clearly has to be the right village and clearly you know to me a lot of but like the fact that they could do that that there was a license for these people to be speaking into and kind of speaking sense and finding reconciliation there was an order to it do we have that anymore very rarely i'm not saying all cases but i'm just saying that often we're not in a community like that and so in, in, in the general principle is just that Sometimes you need to get help, and sometimes it's it's hard, especially I know guys that pri it's, it's like the above me now, right? But in the but in the positive way, like sometimes it is a, it's, a, it's over your head. You 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 guys need help, and if you're not already doing the normal uh, washing and exercise of being in couples counseling, which I believe you should always be in couples counseling. There should not be all my mentors of it. They in couples counseling all seasons of life, once a month. Maybe they'll go to bi monthly. But they don't stop that. They got. They keep that up. Counseling. Sometimes, if you're not already in it, you need to pull it as opposed to going there. Because remember, that person has to then catch up. Then they need to get to know you. Because remember, they're not going to give hard truths because you're still human. You have to develop relationship. They're trying to do due do, do diligence. I'm not saying again. I'm saying they're they're skilled professionals who know what to do. The, still, the point is that you want to kind of ha get help. But sometimes that also that help extends beyond the clinical piece of it, right? Where even having a uh, uh, mentor, couple mentors, up uh, older couple, I believe in that. Having an older couple mentors, that, that should be introduced in your relationship even before it happens. But sometimes when it hits the fan enough and you guys are trusting enough where you can at least get to a point to say, you know what? Hey, I know we're in a bad place. I know we're in counseling. I think it'd be helpful for us to talk to them and asking them to help you. You don't know what it is. this is just a different perspective. You have the clinical piece, but having sometimes a couple, sometimes there's certain things that you can hear and receive because you're seeing it manifest in real life. And so I'm not saying this as somebody who's perfectly gotten that down at all. Clearly, I think we've uh, we laid that out in the beginning of this thing. A lot of this was our aspirations. A lot of these are just, I think, general wisdom that I think would be helpful. But especially if you're kind of ready to throw in that last towel, you know what I'm saying? It's it's helpful to get another perspective on it, especially with people who's known you both, who are committed to you both, who are who will actually show a spiritual or just general maturity. Because not all not all people are are built for that type of stuff. Clearly, where everybody knows that, right? Where in a lot of a lot of cases, the people in the relationship have undermined their ability to do that because they've talked on both sides of their mouth with people about their partner when things were bad. Right. But then when things are good, you don't get they don't get the bounce. So they can't be impartial parties. So I, I just say that those are two things. Thinking about help beyond just the clinical sense is going to really, really help you. Oh, last last thing on help. If, for example, you are seeking any individual, I tend to I even say this in counseling. And I push back against this. I tend to unless there's a, issues of abuse. 
I do not recommend ever, and I'm strong against this. I know some certain clinicians are different than this. Ever doing sessions separate from your spouse or your significant other. Meaning if you're with a couples counselor, you guys should stay together and work through these things together because we're humans and people be saying different things and this, this, this. And, uh, and I've seen that with them. And, but if you are in a council place, you guys should speak to each other about your plan to say, you know what? I think I want to get perspective and I'm going to speak to somebody else, not just somebody. I think sometimes it may be helpful to get, if you have a, a brother, if you have a close friend that's known by the people of the opposite sex to give another perspective that you guys trust, sometimes that's a helpful if it's agreed upon as well. So you, I think it's important, you know, that you guys have a emergency plan when you enter your relationship. During the good times come up what we're going to do when the bad times come because we're, we're humans and we know the bad times will come. So I'm a, just like Lawrence, I'm a big fan of couple therapy. I actually disagree with Lawrence. I actually do like when my therapists do separate sessions. Um, but that's because of the particularities of my partner at that time. I thought that would be very useful for him. Um, but I, I don't, I think you just, you have to, figure out what works for you guys. But I am a huge fan of couple therapy. I didn't, Lauren, uh, Lauren's talked about at least like monthly. I had always believed that even during the good times, we would, you know, do at least five sessions a year just to do like check-ins. I always feel like therapy should be like your, you know, you go to the dentist annually or biannually now, but you go check your eyes, you get a physical. There are things about your mental health that you need to just check in. Just check in and let's just make sure everything is okay. Um, because sometimes people think bottling things up is best for a relationship. And I disagree strongly. I cannot stress how important vulnerability is and just having those difficult conversations in a very diplomatic way. And so one of the last points I want to talk about is how to save your relationship. You have to be gentle. Yelling at your partner with rage or scolding your partner is going to bring around shame. It's going to trigger defense mechanism. Moving in gentleness, moving in love, but still being truthful, right? Sometimes we're so hurt, we are not even aware how loud we are, what that delivery was, right? Sometimes your partner may be drowning in something, right? Perhaps your husband, your male partner, who's the pro financial provider is drowning in the anxiety that the numbers are not adding up. There's a shift in the job. They're downscaling. He might be mentally, emotionally consumed with other things and he doesn't even recognize how he's not checking in. She might be mentally overwhelmed, consumed with parenting for the first time, her body looks different. The baby is here. She doesn't feel like herself. And it's not, she's not snapping back the way she thought she was going to snap back. So therefore she doesn't even have the emotional capacity to check in. So I say that is if you yell at him or her during these emotionally sensitive times, it can really be the straw that broke the camel's back, which is already holding a lot of things. We're just humans. We can only consume so much emotional turmoil from all fronts of our lives. So it's important that as we deliver, as we express ourselves, that we move in gentleness, we move with love, right? And not blame and not things that trigger shame, right? Because we really don't always know where our partner is emotionally. And we project that because he tends to be like this and she tends to be like that while well, she's doing something or he's doing something. But we don't know what other, life is constantly moving, constantly changing. So we don't know where they are. And we always have to, if we see a shift to check in with love, compassion, gentleness, and empathy. I think that is super important as we express our needs. Yeah, I think I, I think I, I'm I'm with you, especially to be gentle. But I, I only caution I give though, is that where the labor lies, meaning 
I think generally you need to be, people need to be gentle, period. I think particularly from a scriptural standpoint, men are called to be that in particular, right? Um, with women, because women, that's higher. So even you saying gentle, I would never say gentle, right? But I do think um, we have to be careful because sometimes, usually sometimes someone's lack of patience in the process of healing often shows perhaps even still a lack of conviction or true contrition for how, what they've contributed to what's happened. Meaning, it, your shame, shame is, is still an individual thing. A person can't be fully responsible for your triggers. A lot of times when we do things wrong, we feel the guilt. And then we then still, even while you're recognizing that you have apologized for the hurt you caused the other person, you're making them responsible for your overbearing of the guilt. Some, at some point, there's something unavoidable. You're gonna have to sit in that. And you may think that it's almost like, you you know, when somebody's been traumatized or like they almost drowned and you touch them just to put a towel on them, they're like, <laughs> when you feel real contrition, you kind of feel like that. So you feel like everything that they're doing seems cold and mean and this, and number one, giving them space. They're upset, they're hurt, right? Because especially we see this on all ends of the spectrum, whether there's a woman upset and stuff like that, we give her the space. To, 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 to lose a little bit. And a guy has to kind of accept that to a sixth extent. So I'm only saying that to say, be careful because sometimes, usually when people haven't really sat in the contrition, and the contrition is sorrow. There's a real, you feel sorrow. If you really have done something, you feel sorrow and that no one likes to feel that, but that's a feeling you can't avoid like grieving. Sometimes people make the other persons give do, undue labor of then still catering and tippy toeing with them because they don't want to feel that. And I think that's something that I see a lot, you know, even from a counselor perspective, that's not their responsibility. That's part of your labor, but not that you're proving anything, but recognizing that's you. And you have to own that while they heal in this process. So yes, in general, gentle, no one is saying go off. Like when women feel, you see like boomerang, Slap, love would have brought you home last night type of stuff where we excuse the frustration. No one is co-signing that. What I am saying is though, sometimes usually our triggers is about us and our guilt and us really fully owning the, re the impact of the, the nonsense we did or the things that we contributed. And then we, may we want them to hold our hand in the process when we have to pursue the forgive uh, the, the, the seek forgiveness and they have to get to that place, right? But I do hold it over now the next person. If they choose to forgive, then they cannot hold that over them anymore. You cannot be badgering them over the head anymore. You cannot, if, once you make that choice, but on the process of the choice, no, that's what humility is. That's the sackcloth, right? If a guy had, uh, if a guy had like, like done something really, really wrong, people don't see the, the problem with the guy coming low and like having to fight and beg that woman to come back. We, that's normal, right? And so I just think for, for us, and I, for me, I think that's a, that's a healthy thing. But I just think it's, it's, it's balanced for us to kind of see that. The flip side though, is that I do think, hold on, I do think there's something around planning. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, I remember it, 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 this was something, this was guidance that I had received in struggling, right? You, you're in the middle of a relationship, you're struggling. Sometimes what helps you to see that you could save this is having a plan when you guys encounter, because a lot of these, these issues are not going to go away. What I'm saying like this, you're both imperfect people to your point of learning. We're all imperfect. We can't have unrealistic expectations for people, but you can have a plan to say, Hey, this, that led to this. If we are here, this, what are we agreeing to? What will be our, Keyword. You, there's people who actually have keywords for when things are getting tense. Apples, or they actually like they'll tell you in council give people keywords or symbols to signal when oh we're getting to that place again or we're arguing about this again. So it signals something that they can go go to the toolkit that they learn. So in some cases, you guys have to develop a plan and a toolkit. If this happens, what are the things we are agreeing to do? What is our process? And how will we keep each other accountable to honor that when, when, it's not if, when it happens again. And so I just, I want to key that in that sometimes it's important to actually be practical and plan. In a lot of cases, writing it out, because that's going to give comfort. And, and the, I think the, to kind of tie this together, because I know I looped into this with this first part of forgiveness. 
Hmm. Hmm. I think that um hmm, hmm. very rarely we've been talking, we've been making up scenarios in our head, right? Like these are hybrid scenarios of all these things we've ever heard of what things that we've experienced. But very rarely a lot of times these issues of saving relationship is it's a paradoxical mutual dance. Sometimes it's not about this person did this, this person did this. Y'all just bucking and none of y'all agree on what the problem is. And so uh, the reason why I say these planning or these shared things are important because I think it puts people on the same page, right? And so to your point, the gentleness is important because we should just be uh, understanding and empathetic in general, but we also both have to be in, uh, own our feelings. I feel when you do X, it makes me feel this. That's healthy no matter what. Two, making a plan together. Um, so I don't want people to think that we're just creating these made up scenarios of like, oh, this person's wrong. This person's wrong. Because by, by and large, a lot of times people don't agree about who's wrong. And that's where they are at. Um, I do want to say this. I know that we're closing is that. It's, you know, every child doesn't learn the same. And, you know, that's one of the defaults of our educational system is that there's a presumption that every child learns the same and therefore we teach in one style. And if a child is not learning in said style, we think there's something wrong with the child. And I say this because there is a way to hold me accountable as Delorney. I'm speaking for Delorney. And I think it is important that Delorney expresses that to her partner that I don't ever want to be slide. I'll never forget my dad told my third grade teacher, don't do Delorney no favors. If she failed, give her the F, right? So I'm not looking not to hold <laughs> my way emotionally. I'm not looking not to hold my way emotionally for my partner. But I, there is a way you communicate with me that brings about that. And there's a way that triggers me like, are you, you know, are you scolding me? Like, you know, as a child, like, you know, and I, and, and I say that because I'm different, right? Every, even when you're a supervisor, all supervisees are not the same. There are people who pick work, pick jobs based on the work culture there. Cause everything is not the same for me and, and for everyone. And I say that because you have to communicate. I, there's some ways men was like, don't talk to me like that. Right. And, and then there's some men who'd be like, oh, she was just mad. That's how she did. Right? Like everyone has a communication style for a reason. And when I say you have to express that to somebody else, because I agree with you, you got to give people space, right? So someone has hurt someone. You got to give them space. I, I like space. I'm, I don't know how people feel about that in relationships, but I like space. I know some people are like, oh, why are you not sleeping in the bed? Why are you not here? I like space. I'm a big solo vacationer as well. So, you know, I don't like space only when I'm mad. I'm a person who's like, hey, I'm, this is my solo trip this year, even in relationship. So I understand the need for space. I understand the need that you are hurting and, and therefore things come up. I understand. Also, women, just like men know how to plead in their way, women know how to put on the right dress, cook the right plate of food, and do all this two-step because they know they're in the wrong. Cook? Right. You know, they know they're in the wrong. They be doing all this extra stuff. Right. Everyone does the butter up to their partner differently. But everybody got a two step when I'm trying to get in this good grace or I'm trying to get in her good grace. Right. It looks different for the genders and personality wise. But everybody knows, oh, this is my thing because I got to get in the good grace. I messed up. Right. So I say that because. I don't think, honestly, I don't like saying that. Men apologize more than women. Women apologize more than no, men. So I think people need to verbalize it more, right? But I think, you know, us women, we be liking to do stuff so we don't have to explicitly say the words. And I do think men verbalize it, but we, like, everybody knows when they're wrong. I think in most healthy relationships, people know when they're wrong. I don't think they know how to admit that very well, but they feel like, well, I can overcompensate in this way to make it up and I can, oh, I can buy her stuff or I can do this to overcompensate for it. But sometimes we just need what everybody wants, honestly, more than gifts, more than a nice dinner, nice dress, sex, whatever, is change behavior. 
And honestly, if there is something that makes you nasty every time you get upset, you might have to do more work than apologize. Because I don't want your apology if it's not a change behavior. And to change that behavior, you have to know the root cause of why you get like this sometimes. And you have to address that. And that's what I want to hear is how you're going to address this root issue. Just telling me you're going to change. Come on, we've lived long enough. Just saying ain't enough. You have to tell me where it came from, what it's here. You've probably been that way your whole life. He, she, they, whatever. So it is so important that what people are really looking for more than words, more than gifts, more than whatever, humility is a change behavior. And that's why it requires so much self-knowledge to figure out. I didn't even notice because relationships are mirrors. I didn't even notice that I get like this when this happens. I didn't even notice how like uh controlling I am or uh how stern I can be in black like I didn't even know I'm too lax to Daisy. I let things slide, right? Like I didn't even know. And there's things a person's gonna bring up with you and you're gonna have to be like, oh wow, I am like that. But let's be honest, it might not change with one conversation. <laughs> you gotta really be proactive about it. It's going to take days and months, but if, as long as your partner, to save the relationship, your partner needs to believe in your change. Mm. They, they need to believe that this relationship can get better. Mm. The conversations we have, the, the wrestling with it we're doing is because we believe it can be better and we see that you are making, the, we're having rich conversation on a deeper level. So it's not like you don't always, you never let me do this. It's like, oh, I like have this thing and I see my mom or my dad and we're having these deep conversations. And as we unearth what causes you to react this way, then we talk about how what's, what you're going to do to address it. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think that is really where I want to tell people is to, to, to save the relationship that needs to be above all things is an identification that there's a problem and then some type of roadmap to that change behavior. And then the person needs to be patient while the person is figuring it out and understands as you learn, there's ebbs and flows, you know? Mm. I, I think this is really helpful. I, I, you don't, I, I agree in the spirit of what you're saying. And I agree with kind of what, how you laid it out at the end. I do think the one pushback point I will have, or at least the, and it may be that you're on the line with this is that um, you may not get understanding right? Like not everybody's going to arrive at the why, right? But I do think there's something universal. I think we both, to the contrition. This, I, this is universal. When someone is truly contrite, so even your point around the example, when somebody really doesn't want to say, like, I'm sorry, you're making the other person do the labor. Well, you know, right? It's like, no, 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 no. That means you're still unwilling to humble yourself enough, right? So clearly you didn't think what you did was that bad. When some, if somebody accidentally shot somebody, no one, I'm pretty sure you're crying, the this, the that, because you're contrite, you see the impact. When someone struggles to be contrite, they still haven't fully grasped the impact of how much that's hurt you or impacted you. And if they're still struggling, that's an indication. But I think beyond, but I think beyond that, I think it's important in the least that even to your point, they acknowledge problem, but they'd be, they be willing to learn so meaning there may you may find somebody in a counseling session they pray they went and meditated with god on the hill in the morning and then they came back they're like you know what it's because what happened in second grade or my dad did this that may happen five percent of the time what more often more happen is that they just don't know but what they do know is that they hurt you and what they do know is that they don't want this to happen again and what they do know is that they in addition to your perspective in terms of what happened they're just willing to be teachable to learn in ways that it won't allow it to happen again because here's the thing just being willing you're not going to find people who are going to be fixed even on this side of glory there are going to be problems that will come up but i could deal with somebody who's just humble and say i know that hurt you and i'm trying my best and i'm learning and i'm willing to learn to try to find ways to do it. you could roll with that all day for the rest of my life i can roll with that what i can't roll with is you know what I mean? Oh, you know, like that someone who's just unwilling or they're still trying to be in charge of the process where they don't, they, they, they don't, they still don't want to hear how you can get better. So I do think there's a slight distinction just to set the right expectations, because I think it's to your point, 
It is beautiful and it is powerful because you want to feel clearly. I don't want this to happen again. I want you to be clear about I want you to be clear about what you did, why you did it, because that's going to help. What, but what I'm saying is that realistically speaking, not people will, sometimes people don't get the why till later in life. They may never know the why. But what you can't when the least they could do is be contrite about the impact to you, be committed to the journey of finding out why and be humble enough to hear from you in the process to prevent that from happening again or when you speak into them or they'll be contrite. Because there's going to be things that your partner is always going to have to apologize about. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're always late. They're always this. They always struggle. But if you see progress and a genuineness that when they, they, they hurt, when it hurts you, it hurts them, I'll roll with that person to the casket drops. Because at least I know that it matters to them and they're doing the best that they can. And because they're a human, they're not going to be perfect in every area. And I can live with that. What I can't live with is someone who's not willing to humble themselves enough to be in a position to be guided or in a position to just go on a search that includes me so we could both do this right together. So I think it's an agreement, but I, I think the threshold, you don't want the threshold to be so high that they feel like I have to figure this all out in order for it to kind of come back. I don't know if that happens all the time. Well, my threshold is high. I do mean that. Um, <laughs> um, but I do want to say one thing, though, and th and the reason why and that's just me, right? Because there's no there's no full rule. But I have a lot of friends, not a lot, but I have a few friends who are yo-yo dieters, right? So they'll they'll be well for for a few months, a year plus. Something happens, and their bad relationship or poor relationship with food emerges again and surfaces again because the problem is they haven't really solved their relationship with food and that comfort it gives them so when something triggers it goes back up to this like really unhealthy relationship with food so for me until you solve which is your relationship with food i think you can suppress it for a long period of time but i think you i and this is me this is just me but i think something can trigger you and then it resurfaces again and then, you know, you hit this cycle like yo-yo dieters do. Um, but I also can, I hear the argument, like, every day is a day, like AA meetings, you know, you just try. But, like, most people who succeed in, like, AA and, like, you know, don't relapse, there's just, like, to me, this, like, deep understanding versus, like, I'm just doing it because, like, I want to keep my children, I want to keep my house. No, people with addiction, they know they have a family, they know they have all this stuff, but because they just are just like, I don't know, they, until they're ready, until they hit that level of insight, that deep understanding, they can't break these addictions. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's how I feel. And that's why I take this like very, I know no one will be perfect, but there's some, there's, and it's not, this is my stance on everything. Like you said, it's certain issues. Like God knows my heart, you guys, I hate cleaning. My, my, my Clementine peels are always in wrap places that but the garbage and there's a lot of repeat telling me my partner used to say, why are your clementine peels right here and i'm like oh i'm gonna throw it away now so there's some issues that i'm not up in creating a standard as to why does the morning forget to like throw things away sometimes but there are certain issues where it's like if you don't hit this core then you're a little ticking time bomb and i can't do it but that's just me and that's just a personal thing that is not a general rule. I'm just talking about my personal feelings about this. Um, so this was a good talk. This was a really good talk, you guys. I, I really enjoyed myself. But to get more content like this, to leave us comments, to give us ideas on what else we should discuss, you have to subscribe, like it, leave us a comment. We want to hear from you. We do this for you guys. And till next week. Peace. Peace.